Welcome to Literary Insights. This is the summary of the book Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution, Rain Wilson. If you like this content, please consider subscribing and liking this video. The author, Rain Wilson, is best known for playing Dwight Schrute on the TV show The Office. He wants to write about spirituality, religion, and humanity's need for a spiritual revolution, even though he readily admits he is no expert or authority on these topics. Wilson defines spirituality as relating to the human spirit or soul, as opposed to physical or material things. He believes we have an eternal soul or essence that continues after our physical bodies die. Spirituality involves practices and perspectives aimed at better understanding and nurturing this soul. Wilson acknowledges that as an actor, he may seem an unlikely or unqualified person to write about such weighty topics. He is imperfect and still struggles with many human faults and frailties. But he has studied, read, and contemplated a great deal on spiritual matters over the years. Wilson comes from an eclectic, bohemian family background. His parents were artsy truth seekers in the 1960s and 1970s. His father was an abstract painter and science fiction author. His mother was an avant garde actress. His stepmother was also artistically inclined. This unconventional upbringing contributed to his lifelong interest in spirituality and meaning. In summary, while acknowledging his limitations and imperfections, Wilson aims to share his perspectives on spirituality, religion, and humanity's need for spiritual growth, which he has developed over many years of study, practice, struggle, and experience. His unlikely background as an actor and comedian has not prevented him from pondering life's deepest questions. Rain Wilson grew up in a bohemian and spiritual family in Seattle in the 1970s. His parents were adherents of the Baha'i faith and hosted many gatherings and studies exploring various faiths and spiritual paths. However, there was a lack of emotional connection and expression in his family. Wilson struggled with mental health issues, addiction, and trauma in his 20s and 30s. He suffered from anxiety, depression, and contemplated suicide at times. He was able to overcome his struggles with the help of therapy, 12-step programs, the support of friends and family, and spiritual exploration. Wilson's difficult life experiences and search for meaning inspired an interest in religion and spirituality. His spiritual journey helped him find balance, healing, and perspective to overcome his struggles. Wilson's parents ran a stall at the Seattle public market. His eccentric and spiritual upbringing shaped his weirdness. He had to observe other kids to learn how to interact in a normal way. Wilson's spiritual explorations and life struggles inspired him to write his book to share insights he has gained. His path has been shaped by teachings from various faiths, especially the Baha'i faith. However, the book is meant for people of all backgrounds. That covers the key highlights and main takeaways from the selected passages on Wilson's spiritual journey, struggles with mental health, and unconventional upbringing. Please let me know if you would like me to explain or expand on any part of the summary. As a child in the 1970s, the author spent a lot of time watching television, especially sitcoms that depicted relatable, flawed families that he aspired to be a part of. Two shows that particularly shaped his identity and spiritual journey were Kung Fu and Star Trek. Kung Fu followed the character Kwai Chong Kane, a half-Chinese, half-white orphan raised in a Shaolin monastery in China. As an adult in 1870s America, Kane searches for his half-brother while using wisdom and martial arts to stand up against injustice. Though the show's casting of a white actor to play an Asian character was racist, the show explored spiritual and moral themes. Star Trek depicted a futuristic utopian society where humanity has transcended greed, prejudice, and conflict. The show explored spiritual and philosophical ideas and conveyed hope for humanity's potential. Though campy, the show inspired optimism and explored profound ideas. These shows shaped the author's view of spirituality and humanity's potential. Kung Fu showed spirituality and morality in action, while Star Trek envisioned an enlightened future society. Though flawed, the shows pointed to humanity's capacity for progress. The author believes these kinds of aspirational stories are more important than ever. Though simple and imperfect, such stories can convey optimism, moral lessons, and a vision of humanity's potential in an accessible way.
The show Kung Fu portrayed a Buddhist monk named Kwai Chong Kane who was very believable and inspiring to the author as a nine-year-old in 1975. Kane was portrayed as a centered, calm, and compassionate character who often confronted ignorant and prejudiced men. The show featured many famous guest stars and was very slow-paced, with long philosophical conversations and flashbacks to Kane's training in a Shaolin monastery. The flashbacks and teachings from Kane's masters, Master Kan and the blind Master Pe, conveyed timeless wisdom and spiritual lessons. The show dealt with themes like revenge, hatred, fear, and peace. The teachings were similar to those found in Christianity, Buddhism, and other religions. The author shares several of these teachings and asks the reader to guess whether they are from Kung Fu or famous religious texts. The teachings advocate living virtuously, overcoming negative emotions, and finding inner peace. The author wishes that more people today would follow these spiritual teachings, especially those prone to hatred, violence, and divisiveness. The show taught transcendent lessons of following a spiritual path, seeking detachment from ego and baser instincts, nurturing virtue, and learning from wise guides. The author asks the reader to imagine themselves as a contemporary monk following an ancient philosophy and martial arts practice. Though living in the modern world, they seek meaning, purpose and self-improvement. They encounter the frenzy of modern life but try to maintain an inner calm and open heart. There are still forces that can be toxic, like rudeness, judgment and self-centeredness. The summary captures the author's admiration for the show Kung Fu, the wisdom and teachings it conveyed, and how those teachings remain relevant today. The author uses the show and its protagonist Kane as an example of following a spiritual path to overcome life's challenges and become a better person. You described various challenging feelings and experiences you encounter in life, such as conflict, anxiety, rejection, disappointment, and suffering. You asked how I will meet these challenges, by being buffeted around like a leaf in the storm or by accepting them as part of life. You suggested that we can allow external events and other people's actions to affect our serenity or we can draw on our inner wisdom to navigate these issues. You said that, according to many religious traditions, we have two purposes on this planet, a personal transformation through spiritual growth and finding inner peace, and contributing to the peace, serenity, and wisdom of humanity as a whole. You used the example of the Baha'i Faith's concept of the twofold moral purpose. You said that spiritual teachings and practices, like Shaolin Kung Fu, provide tools to help us navigate external challenges as well as obstacles we create for ourselves. When we overcome our selfish impulses and negative traits, we can emerge as spiritual warrior monks ready to face difficulties in the world. However, most people focus only on personal growth and inner peace in their spiritual lives. You discussed how Star Trek shows humanity overcoming major problems like war and racism through science and emotional wisdom. The show tackles society's greatest challenges from the perspective of an enlightened future humanity. Although the show can be enjoyed simply as science fiction, it works on a symbolic level, with everything representing a metaphor. Episodes like Let That Be Your Last Battlefield deal with overcoming racism by showing beings who have been warring for trivial reasons. In summary, you discussed facing life's difficulties with wisdom and grace, focusing on both personal growth and contributing to humanity's progress, using tools like spiritual practices to overcome inner obstacles, and learning from visionary works like Star Trek that show an enlightened humanity overcoming its greatest challenges. The key is to not be reactive to external events but to draw on inner wisdom. With practice, we can emerge better able to face difficulties in the world. The original Star Trek series aired in the late 1960s and broke new ground by showing the first interracial kiss on television. This helped advance the civil rights movement by promoting racial tolerance and acceptance. The show explored themes of empathy, compassion, and understanding of those different from us. Episodes taught lessons about overcoming prejudices and seeing from other perspectives. The show promoted an optimistic vision of the future where technology triumphs, hunger and poverty are eliminated, and humanity achieves world peace. In Star Trek, the future is a utopia without greed, violence or conflict. Though Star Trek was focused on science and space exploration, its vision is spiritual at its core. It promotes unity, equity and the greater good of humanity. The show suggests we must evolve beyond selfish interests to achieve this bright future.
The path shown in Star Trek represents one of two spiritual paths, personal inner journey, as shown in Kung Fu, and collective evolution to benefit humanity. Though many see spirituality as a personal journey, most faiths and philosophies actually emphasize serving others and building a just world. We need both personal growth and a dedication to the greater good. Inner peace enables us to serve more effectively, and service awakens us spiritually in turn. We must have compassion for all people and a world-embracing vision, not just focus on ourselves. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. We should seek enlightenment to spread light to others, not just for ourselves. There can be no peace without justice. We must create the future shown in Star Trek, where technology and spirituality unite to end suffering for all. Star Trek and the ideals it represents can serve as a guide for our journey of the soul and our shared future. Though it began as entertainment, its vision of hope and progress still inspires us to build a better world. The passage examines the idea that it is difficult to get the news from poems by comparing it to spirituality. It argues that both provide insight into profound truths about life, even if they are not always practical. The author points out that humanity is currently in the midst of a global mental health crisis, especially among young people. There are high rates of deaths of despair from suicide, drug overdoses, alcoholism, anxiety, depression, and loneliness. There are staggering statistics showing the scope of these mental health issues, including nearly 70,000 annual deaths from suicide or drug-slash-alcohol overdoses in the U.S. One in three children experience an anxiety disorder. Anxiety rates rose 24% from 2016 to 2019. Depression rates tripled during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over 280 million people worldwide suffer from depression. 37 million Americans live alone, up from 33 million in 2011. Loneliness has health effects equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Young adults report much higher loneliness than seniors. Social media use is linked to increased loneliness and isolation, especially among younger generations. Psychological distress is up 75% for ages 18 to 24. The most popular college classes focus on relationships, happiness, and well-being, suggesting students lack tools to address these issues. The author argues we should consider this a pandemic rather than just an epidemic given its scope and severity. Young people seem cut off from meaning and community in a way that is actively harming them. In summary, while spirituality and poetry can provide profound insight, many people today seem to be dying from a lack of the kinds of meaning and connection they provide. There is a vast unmet need for strategies to improve well-being, relationships, and mental health. The world is facing many severe and worsening problems that can be considered pandemics in their own right. These include Declining mental health and well-being, mental health issues are increasing globally at an alarming rate. Racism and prejudice, racism continues to cause discrimination, oppression, and violence around the world. It stems from the belief that one racial group is inherently superior to others. Sexism and misogyny, gender discrimination and the oppression of women are ongoing problems, whether in the form of unequal treatment, denial of opportunities and rights, violence, or subjugation. Materialism and consumerism, there is a tendency in many societies to emphasize material possessions, wealth, and consumption over spiritual or non-material values. This can be destructive both psychologically and environmentally. These are global problems that threaten society in major ways. Solving them will require efforts at both personal-slash-spiritual and institutional-slash-systemic levels. A broader, more compassionate perspective that sees humanity as deeply interconnected can help address issues like racism, sexism and excessive materialism. Education and empowerment are also key, as are political reforms and activism aimed at greater justice and equality. Overall, recognizing these issues as intertwined pandemics affecting global society is an important first step. With awareness and coordinated action, progress can be made. Here is a summary of the key points around our stuff. Humans have an innate primal urge to accumulate resources and goods as a way to ensure survival. This tendency was heightened in the 20th century with the rise of mass consumerism and advertising. 
companies and marketers have gotten very good at manipulating our desires and fears to convince us to buy more stuff, often things we don't really need. Examples include strange expensive beans during COVID-19 panic buying and devices like the Instant Pot. There is an unhealthy obsession with accumulating wealth and status through the ownership of expensive goods and brands. This tendency is glorified in media and culture. At the same time, there is gross economic inequality in the world, with a tiny fraction of people controlling the vast majority of wealth while billions live in extreme poverty. Taxing the rich and voluntary philanthropy are not enough to fix this systemic issue. We need a spiritual shift in how we view success and value others. Nationalism, or extreme pride in one's nation, is on the rise around the world and goes hand in hand with increased militarism and threats of war. There are many potential global flashpoints that could lead to large-scale conflict. We need to find ways to increase global unity and cooperation. Climate change is an existential threat caused by human activity like burning fossil fuels. It leads to rising temperatures, extreme weather, melting glaciers, and loss of biodiversity. It disproportionately impacts the poor and will produce many climate refugees. Urgent action is needed to transition to renewable energy and more sustainable practices. In summary, we have both an unhealthy material obsession as well as lack of concern for others that leads to various threats, including climate change, war, and poverty. We must evolve spiritually and make radical changes to ensure the long-term survival and well-being of humanity. Climate change and its effects, like droughts, can have devastating consequences, as seen in the Syrian civil war and refugee crisis. Addressing climate change requires reducing emissions but also tackling deeper issues like materialism, capitalism, and economic growth. Many of the world's problems are interconnected, including climate change, greed, materialism, selfishness, racism, sexism, militarism, nationalism, loneliness, and mental health issues. There is hope if the world comes together, but change requires a spiritual revolution and people living in harmony with nature and sustainable economic growth. Legislation and policy changes are important but not enough. The issues humanity faces are spiritual in nature and require a change in how people interact and think about each other. Religions and spiritual teachings promote love, kindness, and justice, which are the keys to the transformational change needed. People don't have to ascribe to a particular faith to make use of spiritual teachings. Spiritual but not religious is a growing belief system. Humans are lost and current systems aren't working. A soul-inspired revolution is needed, which requires gaining a vast, long-term perspective, all the way to considering humanity's eventual end. The summary outlines the interconnection between many of the world's problems, the argument that they are spiritual issues that require a spiritual solution, the role of spiritual teachings in promoting necessary values, and the need to take an expansive long-term view to understand what is really needed for humanity. The key elements are spiritual roots, spiritual revolution, and long-term thinking. The author's father recently passed away after complications from heart surgery. According to Baha'i tradition, the author and his stepmother had one hour to wash and prepare his father's body for burial. However, the funeral home did not have an appropriate vessel to hold the water for the ritual washing. The author went to Target to find a suitable bowl. He reflected on the absurdity of the situation, a minor TV celebrity jogging through Target in a suit to find a bowl to wash his dead father's body. He thought his father, with his sense of humor, would find the situation amusing. The author's father was an artist, writer, and spiritual man. When the author's father was unplugged from life support, the author had an epiphany that his father's body was just a vessel, and his true self, his personality, thoughts, and spirit, continued on after death. The author believes there is more to human consciousness than just physical and scientific explanations. Though science can track the biological workings of the brain, human consciousness remains a mystery. According to scientific materialists like Daniel Dennett, consciousness is an illusion created by the brain to make sense of sensory input and stimuli. But the author believes human consciousness points to something greater. There is no direct evidence that consciousness itself aids human survival and reproduction. Human minds seem far more complex than what would be required for basic survival and propagation. 
Consciousness is a mysterious experience that involves emotions, memories, perceptions, and cognition in a dynamic interplay. It evolves over our lifetime and may continue in some form after death. Ancient humans often buried their dead with items they would need in an afterlife, suggesting a belief in some form of ongoing existence beyond death. This ancestor worship may have been one of the earliest forms of religion. Something in human nature seems to point to a spiritual dimension beyond the physical. The human tendency to ritualize death and provide for an afterlife offers no obvious survival benefits but seems almost instinctual. Dreams and consciousness provide a sense of a reality unbound by normal space and time constraints. This may have contributed to ancient beliefs in an afterlife. There are several perspectives that suggest death may not be the complete end of consciousness or existence. Consciousness seems to transcend the physical brain, as evidenced by people with little brain tissue but normal minds, and the role of the body and gut in cognition. Dreams and consciousness hint at a surreal world beyond normal physical limitations. Ancient human practices suggest an instinctual belief in some afterlife or ongoing spiritual existence. For some, spiritual or mystical experiences point to a dimension beyond the physical. So in summary, while there is no evidence consciousness aids basic survival, human consciousness seems geared toward a sense of spiritual existence that transcends the physical alone. This may be partly why ancient humans seem to intuitively believe in an afterlife. The nature of human consciousness and experience hints at a reality not limited to mere physical propagation and survival. Here is a summary of the various perspectives on death presented. Death is a natural transition, like a butterfly shedding its cocoon or getting out of one car into another. It is the next phase of existence, not the end. What comes after death is glorious and meaningful, even if incomprehensible to us now. Our imagination cannot grasp its wonder. We should accept death happily and look forward to new and better forms of existence. Like the sun setting and rising, death allows for new beginnings. Death is simply the shedding of the physical form. Consciousness continues and we retain our ability to perceive, understand, love, and grow. There is continuity of spiritual existence after death. Nothing disappears without a trace. We avoid talking about death in modern culture but many older cultures and religions encouraged contemplating death to give perspective to life. Examples include, today is a good day to die, Maranasati or, remember death, meditations, day of the dead celebrations, Egyptian skeletons at feasts, Sufi mystics in graveyards, Bhutan's focus on death and happiness, Tibetan death meditations on life's impermanence and uncertainty. Death helps us appreciate the preciousness of life, our connections to others, the present moment, nature and compassion. It cuts through the static and helps us live with clarity. We are all dying in some way, so we must make the most of the time we have. The afterlife may be wondrous in ways we cannot comprehend, like a fetus unable to grasp how it will use its newly formed body parts. We should accept the transition of death with faith in the continuity of existence. In summary, reflecting on death gives life deep meaning and helps us live fully while we can. Though incomprehensible, death may be an opening to greater mysteries and new adventures, not the end. We can face it with acceptance, wonder and trust. The passage compares a fetus developing in the womb to humans developing spiritual virtues during our lifetime on earth. Just as a fetus grows sensory organs that will allow it to experience the physical world, humans are growing spiritual organs, virtues like love, compassion, wisdom, joy, etc., that will allow our consciousness to function in the afterlife. The author argues that the purpose of life is to develop these spiritual virtues. We are spiritual beings having a human experience, not the other way around. These virtues are what we will take with us when we die, not material possessions. The author critiques games like the game of life and Monopoly for promoting a superficial, materialistic view of success and happiness. She proposes an alternative, spiritual, game of life where the goal is to develop virtues, not accumulate money and possessions. At the end of this hypothetical game, players discard their material winnings and keep only their spiritual virtue of cards. The hardships and difficulties of life help shape these virtues and make us into wiser, kinder people. The author uses the examples of kind, enlightened elders versus flinty elders to illustrate her point. 
She asks the reader to consider what kind of person they want to become, what spiritual virtues they want to develop. The author's father is used as an example of someone who developed positive spiritual qualities over his lifetime. When he died, he left behind his physical body and possessions, but took with him things like wisdom, imagination, gentleness, and patience. The overall message is that the purpose of life is spiritual growth through developing virtues, not material or physical attainment. Our consciousness and soul continue on after death, shaped by the qualities we cultivate during life. The author describes his complex and evolving relationship with God and spirituality over his life. He grew up with a loving view of God as taught by the Baha'i faith he was raised in. As a teen, he began to see God in the culturally prevalent way, as a judgmental authority figure watching his every move. In his twenties, after moving to New York City, the author rejected spirituality and religion entirely, even trying on atheism for a time. He saw religious people as hypocritical phonies. However, while pursuing his acting studies, the author began to see the pursuit of art as noble and transcendent. His views on spirituality and God started to soften and open up again. He realized that God, whatever God may be, was an inextricable part of human existence and culture. The author argues that God should not be seen as too controversial a subject for television and popular media. Although God is a complex topic, exploring ideas of the divine is crucial to understanding human nature and meaning. In summary, the key points are. The author has had a lifelong, complex relationship with spirituality and God. His views evolved from a loving God, to a judgmental God, to atheism, and then back to an open and curious view of God. The author believes God and spirituality are inextricable from human existence, culture, and the search for meaning. God should not be seen as too controversial a subject to explore in media and television. Exploring ideas of the divine is important to understanding human nature. The author saw being an actor and storyteller as a potentially life-changing role like that of a shaman. Actors were not just hired to say lines but could be truth-tellers, healers, and conduits to a higher reality. Some remarkable performances transcend entertainment and reveal profound truths. However, the author struggled with mental health issues in his early life and career. He felt lost and unhappy despite outward success. This led the author to seek meaning and purpose through spirituality. His friends were vague and noncommittal about belief in God. But the author felt one either believes in God or not, there is no in-between. He studied various faiths and was drawn to Native American concepts of God, like Wak and Tonka. This view of God helped steer him out of his struggles. Before exploring Wak and Tonka, the author wants to discuss atheism. He respects atheists and would be one himself if not a theist. Atheists value science, which the author also appreciates. He does not see science and faith as opposed. The author does not aim to change minds but share perspectives. Debates rarely convert people on huge topics like God's existence. In summary, the author came to view acting as a spiritual role but struggled mentally and sought meaning in various faiths. He was particularly drawn to Native American spirituality and its view of God, which helped him. Though respecting atheism, the author believes one either accepts or rejects God's existence. He hopes to provide thought-provoking perspectives without converting readers. Science and faith have often been positioned as opposites, with science explaining the natural world and faith explaining the supernatural. This is an overly simplistic dichotomy. God or spiritual beliefs and scientific understanding can coexist. Early human cultures invoked gods to explain natural phenomena they didn't understand, like thunder and lightning. As science has advanced, these phenomena have scientific explanations, but God or faith still remain for many. Some see God as the initiator of life and the universe, even if the mechanisms are scientific. Atheists are typically skeptical and rely on evidence, reason, and the scientific method. They reject many literal or implausible religious beliefs and stories. However, atheism is too simplistic a category, and atheists have a range of views. Religion has historically been a source of violence, oppression, and conflict. Many see the Abrahamic God as an anthropomorphic patriarchal figure. 
However, religion also provides meaning and community for many. The simulation hypothesis is a theory that we live in an advanced simulation, like the matrix. This idea is consistent with some religious and spiritual views of life as an illusion and death as an awakening. The theory provides a potential way to reconcile science and faith. In summary, while some see science and faith as irreconcilable, they can coexist. A purely scientific or purely faith-based view of life is limiting. The simulation hypothesis and other perspectives show how spiritual and scientific ideas might intersect. Ultimately, there are many paths to understanding life's deepest questions. The rope and snake analogy is used to represent maya, or illusion. We mistake the rope for a snake in the darkness and become fearful, but then realize it is just a rope. Similarly, we perceive the material world as real but then realize it is an illusion created by our own minds. Maya obscures our vision of Brahman, or ultimate reality. Suffering is one of the strongest arguments against the existence of God. How can an all-loving, all-powerful God allow such misery and injustice in the world, especially inflicted upon innocent people? There are a few possible explanations for this. Human free will and responsibility. Much of the suffering in the world is caused by human actions, not God. We have the tools and ability to cure diseases and prevent natural disasters but choose not to. We cannot blame God for the consequences of our own selfishness, greed, and apathy. Suffering may serve a purpose. Without suffering, there may be no growth or meaning in life. Suffering shapes our character and helps us develop virtues like compassion. The Buddhist concept of dukkha also shows how clinging to impermanent things causes anguish. Eliminating all suffering may make us less human. Our limited perception. We have a narrow, human-centric view of suffering and justice. We cannot comprehend God's greater plan or purpose. What we perceive as unjust may serve some greater good in a way we cannot understand. We must trust in God's wisdom and judgment, even when events are incomprehensible to us. In summary, the problem of suffering does not necessarily prove or disprove God's existence. While the existence of suffering poses a strong challenge to a benevolent God, there are also arguments in response that reconcile God and suffering. Our limited human perspective prevents us from perceiving the whole, complex truth. Here is a summary of the key points. The author argues that without experiencing suffering, pain or hardship, one cannot fully appreciate joy, happiness or ecstasy. A world without any suffering would be absurd and lack meaning or purpose. There are scientific reasons for the existence of suffering. We live in a physical universe governed by natural laws. Our bodies decay, we are susceptible to disease and death, and we have to contend with other organisms that can harm us. Suffering is inherent to our existence as biological beings. Various religious and spiritual traditions suggest that suffering serves a purpose, such as developing virtues like perseverance, empathy and compassion, bringing us closer to God or a higher power, and helping us mature and gain wisdom. Overcoming suffering and finding meaning in hardship is part of our spiritual journey. The author argues he is not an atheist because atheism implies that the universe and life are meaningless and purposeless, which he finds unsatisfying. The complexity and wonders of the universe and consciousness point to something greater than just physical matter and science. The author believes atheism reduces life to just stuff, matter, energy and physical laws. But he finds it implausible that the universe came into being spontaneously for no reason. The existence of something rather than nothing suggests there is meaning or purpose beyond the physical. The author argues atheism makes life's meaninglessness inescapable. But humans have an innate drive to search for meaning that atheism does not fulfill. The transcendence of consciousness points to something more than just biology or an accident of evolution. In summary, the author rejects atheism because for him suffering, consciousness, life's meaning, and the existence of the universe itself point to there being more than just physical matter and natural laws. Atheism is an unsatisfying worldview that fails to account for these deeper mysteries. The author argues that the existence of God, like the existence of love or art, cannot be proven through scientific means or empirical evidence. However, that does not mean God does not exist. 
Concepts like God, love, and art may exist on a higher plane that is not physically measurable. The author suggests thinking of God not as a being but as a concept, like being itself, consciousness, light, nature, or science. God could be the unifying spirit behind all things that scientists search for in a theory of everything. The author cites examples of similar perspectives from a physicist, a chaplain, and religious texts. Rather than focus so much on God as a creator, the author suggests thinking of God as a goal or a way of life to emulate, a source of radiant qualities and energies to draw from. The author argues we should focus less on defining what God is and more on how to live and align with God. In summary, the author presents an argument for thinking about God and spirituality in more conceptual, metaphorical ways rather than literal, personified ways. God may be beyond human comprehension or definition but can still serve as a guiding life force. The author struggled with mental health issues and a crisis of faith as an adolescent in New York City during the 1990s. He rejected the concept of God he had been taught as a child. He then discovered the Lakota Sioux concept of Wakantanka, the great mystery, which resonated with him. Wakantanka is the spiritual power that generates and binds all life. It is not a being or entity but the mysterious power of the seven directions, the four cardinal directions plus up, down, and inside. It is experienced through nature. The author came to understand Wakantanka as the divine within the world, not above it. All of creation, including humans, are part of this great mystery. This is reflected in the Lakota prayer Mitikuyoya Zayang, All My Relations. The author sees Wakantanka as similar to concepts like Gichi Manitou, Great Spirit, of the Algonquin and Teotl, the all-encompassing power, of Aztec belief. These concepts view the divine as imminent in nature and creation, not separate from it. Discovering these concepts helped the author find greater peace and purpose. He wondered what the great mystery's purpose might be for humans, both as individuals and collectively. There must be a greater vision or plan behind all of existence. The author has wanted to explore these ideas in a television show but has not had the opportunity. So, he is sharing them in this book. The key ideas are. A divine power exists within and as part of nature and creation, not separate from it. This imminent divine power has a purpose or vision for human existence. Discovering a concept of the divine that resonates with you can help provide meaning, direction, and peace. Does this summary accurately reflect the key ideas and events in the author's account? Let me know if you would like me to clarify or expand on any part of the summary. The author describes visiting the shrine of Baji in Israel, which is a holy site for members of the Baha'i faith. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, lived there for many years and is now buried at the shrine. The author, his wife, and son traveled there as pilgrims to experience the sacredness of the place. The shrine and its grounds are beautifully maintained, with gardens, pathways, and an ornate iron gate. Upon entering the area around the shrine, the author felt a profound sense of reverence, joy, and peace. Inside the simple stone shrine building, the author removed his shoes and saw many other pilgrims praying while facing Baha'u'llah's burial place. The author prayed, was still, wept, and sat for a long time. He felt a sense of timelessness there. Before leaving, he bowed at the threshold of the inner sanctum. Exiting the shrine, the author backed away slowly out of reverence. He found that after visiting the shrine, his perception of the world felt renewed and clarified, like cleaning a dirty windshield. The experience brought him tranquility, joy, and a sense of spiritual renewal. Holy places like the shrine are centers of divine grace, according to Abdu el Baha. The summary touches on the key details about the author's pilgrimage experience visiting the shrine of Baji, including the sense of reverence, spiritual renewal, and timelessness he felt there. The author visited the shrine of Baji, the most sacred place for Baha'is, and it filled her with a profound sense of tenderness and reverence. This pilgrimage led her to reflect deeply on concepts like sacred, holy, and divine words rarely used in everyday life. She explores different views of the sacred, from Native American spirituality where nature itself is sacred, to conservative Christianity where the Bible and Jesus are sacred, to secular liberalism where human rights and science can be sacred. The author discusses Mircea Eliade's ideas of the sacred and the profane. 
Sacred spaces have divine meaning attached to them, while the profane has no such meaning. Stonehenge is an example, where the stones themselves are not sacred but gain meaning and sacredness when arranged in a circle. Iliad's theory implies that anything not ascribed meaning is profane, but the author questions whether that includes all of nature. She feels we need a new, broader understanding of the sacred. In the end, visiting the Baji Shrine gave the author a profound sense of the sacred that transcended any particular religion or belief system. The sacred seems to emerge from a feeling of connection to something greater than ourselves. The author felt a longing for the spiritual experience of visiting the shrine of Baha'u'llah in Israel. After returning home, he wondered if ordinary places could also be sacred and have spiritual meaning. He reflected that places become sacred through the memories and experiences we associate with them, like the restaurant where he had his first date with his wife. Places of entertainment like music venues can also be sacred. The poet Basho found sacredness throughout nature and in his poetic pilgrimages. The author identified several things that are sacred to him, like his meditation spot in the backyard. He believes sacredness comes from recognizing our interconnectedness and overcoming separateness. He posed questions for readers to consider what is sacred in their own lives and what humanity could benefit from recognizing as sacred. He suggested that rather than sacredness coming from a place or thing, it could be a, a condition of holding divine light and recognizing the sacred nature of all people. He imagined the poet Basho making a poetic pilgrimage today and finding sacredness throughout the modern world. The author believes that living in poetry and making everything sacred is what a pilgrimage is ultimately about. In summary, the key ideas are Sacredness comes from the meaning we ascribe to places and experiences, not just traditional religious sites. Recognizing our interconnectedness and shared humanity can reveal the sacred. We can find and cultivate sacredness in our everyday lives by noticing divine light and meaning everywhere. A poetic pilgrimage involves finding sacred meaning throughout the world, not just in expected places. Promoting more sacredness could help address divides in society. The author almost died giving birth in a poorly equipped hospital in Van Nuys, California. The author saw a 3.5-hour production of Hamlet in Swedish starring Peter Stormare. The author got married to Holiday with bagpipes playing by Mount St. Helens. The author witnessed a glacier calving in Greenland while on a fishing boat. The author won an Emmy for the office soon after the show was almost cancelled. The author swam with dolphins and sea turtles in Hawaii with family. The author's most meaningful experience was touring Jerusalem's old city, especially the Temple Mount area which contains the Western Wall, Wailing Wall, the holiest site in Judaism and a remnant of the Second Temple. The Dome of the Rock, an Islamic shrine built over the foundation stone, which is sacred to Jews, Muslims and Christians. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which marks where Jesus was crucified and resurrected according to Christian belief. The author found visiting these places, so central to major world religions, to be an eye-opening experience that everyone should have. A good guide, like the one the author had named Bruce, can provide historical and cultural context to better understand these sacred and contentious sites. The author visits the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and notices the aggression and hostility between different Christian denominations inside the church. Upon researching further, the author finds that violence frequently breaks out between groups in the church over minor issues. A Muslim family has held the key to the church for over 800 years to prevent fighting over access. The author reflects that much of the world lives according to rigid religious beliefs inherited from the past that often lead to conflict. The secular portion of the world believes religion should be abandoned in favor of science and humanism. However, secular societies in the 20th century also committed horrific atrocities. There are also many religious and secular societies that are predominantly peaceful. The author questions whether religion is even worth it given all the chaos and conflict in the world. To evaluate this, the author examines what actually functions as the dominant religion in modern Western society. Rather than traditional faiths, capitalism and celebrity culture have become the focal points of worship. Skyscrapers are the new temples, and celebrities are the new gods. Their every move and word are followed with religious fervor on social media. Sports have also become a kind of religion, giving people a sense of community and purpose that was once provided by faith. 
The excessive devotion to celebrity and consumer culture suggests that human beings have an innate drive for worship that will channel itself into whatever forms are available in a given time and place. Rather than abandoning religion altogether, we may need to rediscover and revitalize the positive values at the core of all faiths. In summary, the author argues that human beings have an innate drive for worship and meaning that will express itself through whatever belief systems are dominant in a culture. While traditional religions are declining in the West, celebrity, consumerism, and sports fandom have become the new forms of devotion and community. The conflict caused by rigid religious doctrines suggests faith needs to rediscover its unifying values. Simply abandoning religion may not solve humanity's need to find purpose and belonging. The fastest growing religious group today is the knowns, people who identify as atheist, agnostic, or spiritual but not religious. They make up over a third of millennials and an even higher percentage of Gen Z. 60% of knowns grew up in religious families, often Protestant Christian. A third meditate and consider themselves spiritual. Their numbers have grown 60% since 2008 while church membership has declined. Reasons for leaving religion include Disagreement with religious teachings, especially around sexuality, gender, and science. Dislike of the alignment of religion and conservative politics. Judgmentalism, hypocrisy, and anti-church feeling. Emphasis on individualism over community. Religion has let people down. Many see spirituality as a personal, internal journey rather than a shared, community endeavor. William James defined religion as the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude. The benefits of this include seeking truth and meaning in one's own way. But the pitfalls include a focus on what makes me feel good, treating spirituality like a smorgasbord and drifting into narcissism. A personal spiritual practice is important but should not end there. It must lead to something more than just internal peace and balance. Anything done purely for oneself risks being self-centered. True spirituality, according to Buddhist monk Fap Hu, involves compassion for others, not just the self. It leads to social action and making a positive difference in the world. The key points are that while a personal spiritual journey has value, it should not be the end goal. True spirituality involves cultivating compassion and taking action for the greater good. A spirituality that focuses only on the self risks narcissism and lacks purpose or direction. For many young people today, more traditional religious institutions have let them down. But in abandoning them altogether, something may have been lost, a sense of shared meaning, values and community. The spiritual knowns are seeking to forge a new path, but must avoid the pitfalls of an overly individualistic and self-centered practice. Spirituality at its best connects us to something greater than ourselves and compels us to make a positive difference in the world. Looking at spiritual practice with a what's-in-it-for-me attitude neglects the suffering of others and leads to selfishness. True spirituality involves both personal transformation and service to others. The recent popularity of ayahuasca and other hallucinogens as a shortcut to spiritual enlightenment is misguided. These practices have been used for thousands of years as part of indigenous religious rituals, but taking them occasionally as a tourist experience is superficial. True spiritual practice requires devotion, discipline, and service to others. The early Christian church provides an example of a spiritual movement focused on unity, progress, and serving others. In its first 300 years, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire with the message that there was one God and people could achieve salvation by emulating Jesus' acts of service. This message brought together people from diverse religious and cultural backgrounds. This era shows how religion can be a positive force for unity, progress, and enlightenment. Looking at the universal truths that unite the world's religions may be a path to overcoming the disunity and conflict often associated with religion. In summary, true spirituality requires a balance of personal transformation and service to others. Unity and progress come from focusing on the universal values that unite us rather than on the surface differences that divide us. A uh, what's-in-it-for-me attitude and superficial practices like occasional hallucinogen use are misguided approaches that will not lead to real spiritual enlightenment or unity. Early Christianity accepted people of all backgrounds into its membership. One only needed to be baptized to join. 
They even had open-door church services where anyone could attend. This inclusiveness was revolutionary. For the first time, a religious group spanned tribal and geographic boundaries. All were seen as equal before God, regardless of gender, class, ethnicity, or background. Other religions, like early Buddhism and Islam, were also inclusive. They focused on transcendent spiritual truths, not tribal rituals. They welcomed members of all castes and classes. Like Christianity, they also emphasized charity and altruism. While the world's major religions are very different in many ways, they share some universal truths. Belief in a higher power or God. Even Buddhists believe in a spiritual force guiding enlightenment. Belief in an afterlife. Most religions believe in some form of life after death. The power of prayer. Most religions believe prayer or meditation can have spiritual power. A sense of transcendence. Religions help followers transcend worldly concerns through spiritual enlightenment or closeness to God. Community. Religions bind groups of people together. A moral code. Religions provide guidelines for moral and ethical behavior. Emphasis on love. Most religions see love, whether for God, others, or all beings, as a central virtue. Compassion. Religions encourage followers to show compassion for others. Service. Religions often call on followers to serve the poor and less fortunate. Purpose. Religions give followers a sense of meaning or purpose in life. So while religions differ in many particulars, at their core they share some common elements focused on spirituality, morality, community, and purpose. By emphasizing these unifying factors, religions have helped humanity progress to more altruistic and inclusive ways of living together. Life is fleeting and small in the grand scale of the universe. Despite humanity's self-obsession, everything eventually returns to dust. Nearly all religions believe in some form of existence after physical death. This could be a heaven, hell, reincarnation, or a spiritual realm. The material world is not the only world. Prayer is a core part of most faith traditions. It is a way to connect with the divine through supplication, gratitude, awe, and communion. Prayer can take many forms, from chanting to meditation to selfless action. Religion helps humanity transcend selfish and material interests. It helps us rise above our programming and conditioning to serve community. Many faiths encourage transcending the ego and material desires. Religion binds communities together over a shared belief system and values. Early communities were based on family and location, but religion creates community across wider geographies and groups. Community is a group of people with shared interests, and religion gives people shared interests that cross other divisions. In summary, these five ideas show how religion helps provide meaning and purpose, connects us to something greater than ourselves, binds communities together, and helps us transcend egoistic interests. Despite humanity's imperfections, religion points to nobler aspects of human existence. Religious communities allowed people to bond over a shared set of beliefs, values and practices. This fostered a sense of togetherness that went beyond family or ancestry. By engaging in rituals, ceremonies and acts of worship together, people formed close social connections and a common identity. This provided meaning, purpose and stability. While religion has declined in many societies, the human need for community remains. Online groups have emerged as a new way for people to find community, but they often lack the depth of connection and trust found in traditional religious groups. Religions also often provide a moral compass for societies. They put forth universal values of right and wrong that go beyond cultural norms. When societies move away from these absolute moral codes in favor of relativism, it can lead to a decline in civility and an increase in harmful behavior. Love is at the core of many spiritual and religious traditions. Unconditional love for oneself, others and the divine is seen as the highest ideal. Poets and mystics throughout the ages have extolled love as the deepest truth and the ultimate force in the universe. While the English language has many words, it lacks nuance when it comes to describing the different forms of love. Expanding our understanding and expression of love is an important task. 
In summary, community, morality and love were three of the greatest gifts that religious faiths bestowed. Although religion is declining, finding new ways to foster these qualities may be key to human flourishing. A shared sense of meaning and purpose, universal values, and profound love and connection are deeply human needs that we all seek to fulfill. The concept of Hezd in Hebrew scriptures refers to God's steadfast, covenant love and mercy. God's love is unconditional and all-encompassing. The ancient Greeks and early Christians used the word agape to convey the highest, most profound form of love, the love of God for humanity and humanity for God. It implies universal love and selfless service to others. All spiritual traditions describe love as a primal, cosmic force that binds all of existence together. Love is the underlying power that governs the universe. The Golden Rule, in its various forms across faiths, teaches compassion, to treat others the way you want to be treated. It highlights our shared humanity. All religious faiths emphasize service to the poor and less fortunate as a way to show love and compassion. Generosity and charity are considered virtuous in every tradition. Religion often provides a sense of meaning, purpose and direction in life by answering life's biggest questions. Each faith offers its followers a path to meaning, enlightenment or salvation. Having a sense of purpose, to serve God and help others, gives life profound meaning. We are here to support each other on this journey. In summary, the common threads that unite world religions are love, compassion, kindness, generosity, and a shared sense of purpose. These principles point to our shared humanity and the underlying oneness of all spiritual truths. Finding meaning and purpose in life, whether on a big picture level or an individual level, is a major goal for humans. Religion traditionally has provided answers and guidance on both levels. On a big picture level, religions point to building a loving, compassionate, and just community and transcending selfish interests to reach for larger goals, like ending poverty. On an individual level, religions call on people to use their talents, develop virtues, and serve the community. There is a current mental health crisis, especially among youth, characterized by increasing rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and despair. Religion's ability to provide community, purpose, and connection could help address this crisis. However, many people today, especially younger generations, reject organized religion. They see it as outdated, divisive, and unable to address today's issues. So, a new religion may be needed. Studies show religious people report being happier and more civically engaged, living longer, smiling more, and being more charitable. Religion seems to provide benefits, even if its institutions are flawed. A new, universal religion could provide spiritual and communal benefits without the baggage of existing religions. It could correspond to humanity's current stage of development and unify people across divisions. In summary, while religion has its issues, it also has benefits. A new, universal religion could harness the benefits of spiritual community and purpose without the problems of established religions. This new religion could help address the current crisis of meaning and the decline in well-being, especially among youth. A new religion is needed that embraces the universal teachings of major world religions, is compatible with reason and science, and focuses on practical life teachings rather than doctrinal beliefs. Such a religion would create new rituals and artistic expressions that promote reverence for life and human solidarity. However, a new religion cannot simply be invented. It requires a great spiritual teacher to launch it when the time is right. Without such a teacher, the effort here is to construct the framework for a hypothetical new religion called Soul Boom. It would be grounded in a sweeping mythology that provides a narrative of humanity's spiritual evolution. Soul Boom would have the universal attributes of major world religions, belief in a higher power, belief in an afterlife, the power of prayer, transcendence of ego, community, moral teachings, and the primacy of love. Soul Boom's higher power would be a creative, loving force, not a judgmental deity. There would be no concept of eternal damnation or hell. Hell would be defined as spiritual lostness and distance from the divine. Soul Boom would incorporate spiritual practices like prayer, meditation, and mindfulness to transcend ego and connect with the divine. Soul Boom would focus on empowering and mentoring youth, who have often sparked the greatest social revolutions. 
Soul Boom would derive its moral code from universal teachings of major world faiths, interpreted by a council. Individuals' relationships to the moral code would be a personal matter of conscience. Love, for all of creation, would be the highest teaching of Soul Boom. The key principles of the Soul Boom faith are Time is love, love is a universal law like gravity. Love for everyone should radiate out like sunlight. Laughter is love, love involves a playful, joyful, light-hearted interaction with the universe. Increased compassion, compassion is the essence of humanity. It is needed to create a harmonious world. Service to the poor, rather than charity, empowering the disenfranchised through opportunity, education, skills, healthcare, etc. is needed. Strong sense of purpose, the purpose is to transcend a personal god and dogma, based on experiencing unity in all of nature and spirit. No clerics, there is no hierarchy or positions of authority. Leaders are trusted servants. Everyone's interpretation is valid. Diversity and harmony, diversity of all kinds is embraced but there is recognition of common humanity and shared spiritual nature. Centrality of the Divine Feminine, the Divine Feminine, represented by goddesses of creation, prophecy, provision, healing, and leadership, is re-honored. Cooperation between science and faith, faith and science work together through an evidence-based approach. Ancient wisdom is balanced with modern knowledge. Broad ecological concern, there is a recognition of the interconnectedness of all life and a responsibility to protect the planet. Personal responsibility and integrity, each person takes responsibility for their choices, commits to integrity and continual self-improvement. Flexibility of belief, beliefs can evolve based on new insights and understandings. An open and questioning approach is promoted. Reverence for all life, all of life, from smallest to largest, is infused with intrinsic worth that should be honored and protected. Wisdom of the ancients, ancient spiritual, mystical and indigenous wisdom is respected but reinterpreted for modern times. Community service, putting compassion and service into action through volunteer work that contributes to the greater good of all. The central principles revolve around love, compassion, diversity, personal responsibility, openness, and protecting life. The Soul Boom faith aims to bring ancient wisdom into modern times through an inclusive, egalitarian, ecologically minded, and socially conscious approach. Science and spirituality are two methods of examining and interacting with the same reality. They provide complementary ways of understanding the world. Indigenous spiritualities show a deep connection with nature that provides meaning and guidance. Spending time in nature has psychological and neurological benefits. Justice and service are central to spirituality. We must seek justice, defend the oppressed, and make service to others central in our lives. Practical spiritual teachings and tools can help guide our lives, like focusing on the good qualities in people rather than the bad. Simple teachings from spiritual leaders can provide profound guidance. There is an essential harmony between science and religion. They are not opposed but rather two ways of gaining insight into the unified field of forces that shape our lives. We must reconnect with nature and understand our sacred connection to the earth. Lack of connection with nature has led to crises like climate change. Spending time in nature has benefits for individuals and society. Justice is necessary for peace and unity. We must pursue justice and equity, not see them as partisan or controversial. Spiritual teachings call us to seek justice. A life of service, where we center our lives around doing good for others, brings meaning, fulfillment and happiness. We must serve others to find ourselves. The iconic blue marble photo of Earth taken in 1972 during the Apollo 17 mission was transformative. It showed humanity our shared home planet in space for the first time. Seeing this photo as a child, the author resonated with its power and meaning. It has been the most reproduced photo in history. The photo launched environmental and peace movements. It made wars seem obsolete, pollution like a crime. It spurred conversations and a push toward world unity. In the 1960s and 70s, world peace seemed possible and was sincerely hoped for. Students wrote about it, beauty contestants wished for it, hippies had proposals for achieving it. Now we seem farther from world peace. 
There are more borders, more us versus them divisions. People cling to tribes and factions. We need another photo like the blue marble, something to remind us of our shared humanity and shared fate. We must remember we are all in this together on this pale blue dot. Despite perils like climate change, the author is hopeful. Young generations care about the planet and justice. Technology connects us. We just need leadership and a shared vision of our connectedness. The blue marble reminds us of the beauty and fragility of Earth, our only home. We must come together to solve problems and make peace to ensure Earth remains a bright blue gem in the blackness of space. The key ideas are that we need reminders of our shared humanity and planet in order to make progress on world peace and unity. The blue marble photo provided that reminder in the past, and we need new reminders for today to motivate people to come together to solve global problems. Despite serious issues, there is hope if we can foster a vision of our connectedness. In the 1970s, the famous blue marble photo of Earth from space inspired humanity and fueled hopes for world peace. But over time, cynicism grew and the goal of world peace faded. Now many believe countries will always be in conflict. The author believes recent disclosures of UFOs slash UAPs show that aliens are observing and discussing humanity. The author imagines a comedic dialogue between two aliens, Skubash and Percent Asterisk and Carrot 11 Plus, discussing their observations of humanity. Percent and Carrot 11 Plus says humans know climate change is an existential threat but aren't really addressing it due to costs, short-term thinking, and denial. Skubash finds this confusing and contradictory. Percent and Carrot 11 Plus compares it to the story of the Lorax. Skubash is surprised humans are still warring given their history of huge losses from conflict. Percent Asterisk and Carrot 11 Plus says there is still conflict, and compares humanity's situation to Charlie Brown always trying to kick the football. Percent and Carrot 11 Plus observes that eight humans have as much wealth as half the planet, and Skubash finds this appalling and doesn't understand why it's allowed or why people don't revolt. Percent and Carrot 11 Plus says it's due to politics, belief in job creators, and racism. Skubash suggests leaving humanity to destroy itself or blowing up Earth. But Percent Asterisk and Carrot 11 Plus says that despite humanity's flaws, humans are capable of great good and beauty, like the works of Dr. Seuss and human art. So they continue to observe. The author finds it refreshing to view humanity through an alien lens, to imagine how an advanced extraterrestrial civilization might view our activities and priorities on Earth. From this perspective, many human systems and activities seem misguided, broken, or nonsensical. For example, the massive amounts spent on political campaign ads and global advertising could be better spent solving urgent problems like world hunger, climate change, or lack of education. However, some new optimists argue that overall, the world has made a great deal of progress. Measures of human well-being like poverty rates, life expectancy, and infant mortality have drastically improved over the last century. And new technologies continue to improve our lives. So in some ways, things seem to be getting better. Yet in other ways, things seem to be getting worse. Threats like climate change, biodiversity loss, and political instability seem poised to undo human progress. For young people in particular, it can be hard to determine whether things are improving or falling apart. The author argues that in reality, both constructive and destructive forces are at work simultaneously. While humanity progresses toward greater global integration and unity, as evidenced by movements addressing issues like racism and sexism, there are also powerful forces of disintegration, as evidenced by increasing geopolitical tensions and environmental destruction. According to the Baha'i teachings, this dynamic represents two parallel powers, the forces of integration that advance progress, and the forces of disintegration that tear down barriers to progress. Both are ultimately driving humanity toward a unified, just, and sustainable future, even if the path is difficult. From this perspective, the current strangely disordered world can be seen as part of an evolutionary process, however chaotic, toward a harmonious global society. Overall, despite doomsayers, the unification of humanity in a shared spirit of mutual care and responsibility is our necessary destiny. The world seems strangely disordered with many systems broken or dysfunctional. 
The author provides many examples across society and government. The two-party political system in the U.S. is called out as particularly toxic and broken. The deep partisan divide is seen as one of the greatest threats. The Founding Fathers warned against the dangers of political parties dividing the country. The partisan divide is compared to violent soccer fan gangs, Baris Bravas, in Argentina that are deeply enmeshed in politics. Loyalty to one's political party in the U.S. is seen as almost random and fanatical as to a sports team. While there are policy differences between the parties, polling shows voters actually agree on many issues. But these areas of agreement are rarely discussed. Instead, the focus is on disagreement and portraying the other side as threatening. The conclusion is that there is a strange disorder to many of our systems and institutions that needs to change. Partisanship is a major factor driving dysfunction. The author argues that our political system is broken and partisan. It's not about public service or benefiting people, but about gaining and keeping power. Proposed solutions like electing charismatic leaders, winning supermajorities, campaign finance reform or eliminating the electoral college won't fix the root problems. The foundation of the system itself, based on competition and winning over all else, is unsustainable. A spiritual revolution with a new foundation based on cooperation, unity, humility and selfless service is needed. The author has discussed obstacles like pandemics of greed, conflict and self-interest, as well as topics like death, atheism, religion, consciousness and God to provide perspective. Though religions have caused destruction, they also provide wisdom and tools for change. The author created a new religion, Soul Boom, to illustrate this. To continue the metaphor, humanity is like a car that needs repair. Instead of transmission or electrical problems, the systems breaking down are things like equality, education, healthcare, environment, economics, and justice. Fixing these systems will require reimagining foundations and making both inner and outer changes. The seven pillars of a spiritual revolution are Integrity, having strong moral principles and honesty. Inquiry, asking questions and seeking truth. Imagination, envisioning new possibilities. Intention, determining to make positive change. Inclusion, embracing diversity and promoting justice. Inspiration, motivating ourselves and others. Integration, unifying ideas and people. Making changes will require openness, courage and persistence against resistance. But coming together in pursuit of justice, equality, ethics and human rights can transform humanity. Our shared story can move from competition to cooperation, scarcity to abundance, and fear to love. The author argues that practically every societal system is flawed and dysfunctional. While we can imagine an ideal world where people live in harmony and cooperation, the reality is quite different. The root cause of the problem seems to be a spiritual imbalance, our systems are built upon humanity's worst qualities like aggression, greed, and self-interest. To fix this, the author proposes seven solutions. Create a new mythology, we need to tell a new story of humanity that focuses on our best qualities like compassion and generosity instead of survival of the fittest. The current story perpetuates an us-versus-them mentality. Celebrate joy and fight cynicism. We must nurture positive emotions and hope instead of succumbing to cynicism. Destroy adversarial systems, our political, economic and social systems are based on competition and conflict. We need to replace them with cooperative systems. Build something new, don't just protest, it is not enough to criticize the existing systems. We must build new models to replace them. Systematize grassroots movements. Grassroots movements for change need to be coordinated and systematic to have real impact. Invest in virtues education, we need to educate people, especially the young, in positive virtues and character traits. Harness radical compassion, we must cultivate compassion for all of humanity to overcome divisions and unite in common purpose. The author acknowledges this is an oversimplified solution but hopes it spurs deeper thinking on how to transition society to being based on humanity's best spiritual and moral qualities. Our biggest idea so far, money and commerce, has led to much darkness in human history. It is time for a new idea. The first known form of writing was not a story, song, myth or fable. 
It was a business record, a clay tablet recording wages paid to workers over 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. While commerce and money have enabled progress, materialism and, just a little more, seem to define human existence. We need a bigger vision. Suzanne Samard's research shows forests operate through cooperation, not survival of the fittest. Trees communicate and share resources. This model of interdependence could apply to humans. We are one family, we are good. We need a new mythology based on this. A proposed new myth, humans started in community, close to nature. We dreamed big, solved problems, fought evil. But we lost our spiritual selves. We had a choice, continue as before or restart. We chose hope, relying on human goodness. We became one family and found joy. Cynicism is a pandemic. It leads to inaction because, what's the point? It especially affects youth and mental health. We must foster joy and squash cynicism. The forces inhibiting change want us cynical and hopeless. Joy, not optimism, counters cynicism. Optimism ignores difficulties and complexity. Toxic positivity pressures people to be positive, causing shame in those struggling. Joy acknowledges hardships. It is a choice and force that can be spread, even without feeling it. Joy gives strength, sharpens intellect and clears understanding. With joy, we cope better. The key message is that joy gives us strength, clarity and resilience which helps us find our purpose in helping others. The author identifies with Abdu Elbaha's teaching that joy makes us more focused, productive and open to new experiences. Our mind and heart work better together. Spreading joy to others has a positive impact on our own emotional state. This is supported by research on pro-social behavior. In a disunited world, finding precious points of unity where different perspectives overlap can help nurture joy and hope. The concept of hope punk focuses on fighting injustice and demanding a kinder world. This requires caring deeply and believing we can build a better world together. Systems built on competition, self-interest and greed tend to become corrupt, as with cryptocurrencies. We need to reinvent systems based on cooperation. The Baha'i Faith Selection System reduces conflict by focusing on qualities needed in leaders rather than individuals. Voting in prayerful silence helps elect those inspired to serve the community. This exploits human capacity for cooperation, not competition. The key lesson is that we need to build systems, communities and relationships based on cooperation, not competition and self-interest. This can help cultivate joy, hope and purpose. The passage describes the Baha'i process for electing leadership as a silent, contemplative process where the community carefully considers who shows the greatest faithfulness, sincerity and competence and votes accordingly. Campaigning and self-promotion are discouraged. Those elected gain no special status and serve the community. The author contrasts this sublime vision with the reality of loud, divisive elections in the contemporary world. The author proposes imagining this process in a small town, where the city council resigns and asks the town to silently and contemplatively vote for wise and caring leaders. This reinvents a broken system. Making these changes will require hard work and sacrifice to build new models that make the old ones obsolete. The author argues our culture is very good at war and opposition, using war metaphors for everything from business to relationships. This lends itself to a culture of protest where we aggressively attack injustices but solutions are simplistic slogans. After outcries, little changes. The culture of protest is an inadequate response and often those who were protesting end up acting the same as those they opposed. The author gives the example of living in Nicaragua, where the opposition Sandinistas took power from Somoza but enacted the same oppressive policies. Protest groups often end up creating what they were protesting against. The author argues for building new models rather than just protesting the old, to achieve real change. In summary, the key ideas are. The Baha'i election process is a sublime, contemplative model of community leadership selection. Contemporary elections and culture are too oppositional, divisive and simplistic. A culture of protest is an inadequate response and often replicates the problems it opposes. 
Real change requires building new models, not just protesting the old ones. There are examples where opposition groups gained power but enacted the same oppressive policies they had protested. Making positive changes will require hard work, sacrifice and building new systems to replace broken ones. Does this summary accurately reflect the key ideas and arguments the author is making? Let me know if you would like me to clarify or expand on any part of the summary. Here's a summary. Decolonization is about undoing colonialism and its harms, not just switching the groups in power. It's about replacing the entire colonial power dynamic with cooperation and community. If we don't fix this, the same problems will keep happening. It's easier to protest than to create solutions. Real change requires long, difficult work with organizations and communities. While protests raise awareness and can lead to change, they usually need follow-up action to be effective. There are many builders creating change through activism and community work. Though not famous, these local heroes are creating solutions to societal problems. They work at the grassroots level to systematically address injustice. An example from Soul Pancake shows how white supremacists organize to radicalize others, in contrast with less effective progressive responses. To combat forces like white supremacy, progressives need systematic organization and thoughtful action. Calling in and educating others is better than public shaming, calling out. Shaming often lacks nuance, assumes guilt and prevents growth. It can push people toward extremism by making them feel unwelcome elsewhere. Effective social movements require organization and planning, not just spontaneous action. While they aim to motivate grassroots support, successful movements are strategic. The civil rights movement, for example, was choreographed to maximize impact. Rosa Parks and MLK Jr. were part of long-term organization and planning. People seek purpose and belonging through movements bigger than themselves. Unfortunately, Progressive groups often mistakenly think grassroots work should be disorganized. The most impactful campaigns are actually well-organized and systematic. In summary, real change requires collaborative organization and follow-through, not just outraged protest. Successful social justice efforts strategically organize communities and solutions, rather than reactively calling out those with narrow or uninformed views. Effectiveness comes from inclusive action, not public shaming. Rosa Parks was not just some random tired seamstress. She came from a long line of activists in her family and community. Her courageous act of refusing to give up her bus seat was part of a much larger, well-organized movement that had been planned for a long time. After Parks's arrest, the Montgomery Improvement Association organized a bus boycott under Martin Luther King Jr.'s leadership. They set up an alternative transportation system to help protesters and continued the movement even after many leaders were arrested. After about a year, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated buses were unconstitutional. The civil rights movement built on the nonviolent protest techniques of Gandhi and Christian ethics. Activists studied and trained in nonviolent protest, preparing for the violence and threats they would face. The black community provided support through churches, newspapers, and intellectuals. Churches gave protesters shelter, food, and emotional support. Newspapers informed people about the goals and events of the movement. Intellectuals developed and spread the ideas behind the movement. The civil rights movement was a grassroots movement that required organization, planning, and community participation. It was not spontaneous or leaderless. People at all levels were involved and played important roles. We should build our own grassroots movements and communities to work for positive change, starting small in our local areas. We can find common causes and work together systematically to create change, following the examples of leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Mother Teresa. Education often fails to teach students essential life skills and virtues. Students may learn useless facts but not how to manage their finances, health, relationships, or work. Schools should teach spiritual virtues and positive character traits, not just academic subjects. Virtues can and should be taught, not just learned through cultural osmosis. Parents and teachers need to make a conscious effort to develop virtues in children. That covers the key points and arguments the writer makes about the organization and purpose of the civil rights movement, 
the need to build our own grassroots movements for change, and the importance of teaching virtues and life skills in education. Please let me know if you would like me to explain or expand on any part of the summary. Virtues and positive character traits need to be actively cultivated through instruction and guidance. The author witnessed the power of focusing on virtues and character building in a youth program she helped lead. By studying, discussing and practicing various virtues each week, the students' behavior and language matured. Compassion in particular is a crucial, powerful and transformative virtue. The author proposes an idea for a, a compassion machine, an immersive technological experience to help people develop emotional empathy by virtually experiencing the lives and suffering of very different people around the world. However, we already have the ability to develop compassion using our human heart. We can focus on and train our heart to join in deep union with less fortunate people through empathy. There are different levels of understanding another's experience. Pity, I feel sorry for you, empathy, I feel what you feel, compassion, your suffering causes me suffering, and I want to help end it. Compassion leads to action, unlike empathy alone. It is the highest form of understanding another and leads to the most positive change. Developing compassion at a societal level could lead to greater peace, justice and human flourishing. The concept of radical compassion implies extending compassion beyond one's immediate circle to embrace all of humanity. It goes beyond empathy and sympathy to drive action to relieve suffering. Regular compassion pauses at empathy while radical compassion motivates transformative action. Radical compassion recognizes our shared humanity and interdependence. It helps build connections between disparate groups and reconciles differences. Like a muscle, compassion must be exercised and nurtured. Practicing compassion for others increases happiness and well-being. Several concepts related to radical compassion include Relationship and connection, our relationships with others are what really matter in life. Community, cooperation and consultation, working together towards a shared purpose. Unity and diversity, recognizing shared interests while respecting differences. Diverse parts functioning harmoniously together. Radical compassion is a profound unity that transcends separation. It is recognizing our shared existence as part of an interdependent whole, like the diverse cells and systems that make up the human body. Our planet and society similarly depend on diverse parts working in harmony. Radical compassion is the antidote to humanity's illusion of separation. It is the spiritual revolution that can transform civilization. Humanity has long perceived the world through a lens of duality and separation. We saw differences between groups and were in frequent conflict. This outlook is centered on ego and individualism. It has led to problems like disease, conflict, and tribalism. Globalization and new technology have fostered an understanding of our interconnectedness. We realize we affect each other and must work together. This is planetary consciousness. But interconnectedness is not enough. We must see that we are all actually one, like waves in an ocean. When we adopt this perspective, we transcend limits and find meaning. Many spiritual teachings and thinkers point to this kind of non-dualistic understanding. By embracing it, humanity can mature and progress. The author recommends many books on spirituality, philosophy, science, and society that have inspired this viewpoint. The author thanks many friends, family members, and experts who helped in researching and writing this work. The Bassoon King is the humorous autobiography of the American actor and comedian Rain Wilson, best known for his role as Dwight Schrute on the TV show The Office. Wilson recounts his awkward and dorky upbringing, his struggles as an aspiring actor in New York City, is eventually finding fame playing the weird and eccentric Dwight on The Office, and how his life and career have been shaped by his quirky, offbeat, and self-deprecating personality. The memoir is a light, comedic look at Wilson's unusual journey in his reflections on art, faith, creativity, and embracing one's inner weirdness.